Paulus Kessoranos, Kai Timotheus, a Ecclesia Thessalonicon, Enteo, Pe Eregemon, Kai Curio Jesu Christo, Caris Umin Kai Erene Apo Teo, Patros Hemon, Kai Curio Jesu Christo. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church in Thessalonica, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives the uh, salutation at the beginning that he always gives to designate it was him and not somebody counterfeiting him, which was a problem. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus the Messiah. Thus far, no complications. Eucharistin. Now, Eucharistin means to be thanking. It's where you get the word Eucharist. Most Catholic people do not understand what Eucharist really means. If they did, they do it was a misnomer the way they use it because they think it is the same sacrifice as Calvary <laughs> happening again. Uh, Jesus continues to die sacramentally when, in fact, even the word Eucharist itself means the thanksgiving for what he did do when he died once and for all. It's one of the many problems in Catholic theology, and it's one of the reasons they prefer Latin to, to Greek. You, you can circumvent the issues uh, more expediently as long as the people don't know Greek very well. Euchariston, o felibon, toteo, pantote pen humon adelphoi. Catos axion estin, hoti, Huporoxane, Epistes, Burno, Ke, Pleonese, He, Grape, Henus, He, Kestu, Panto, Human, Es, Elos. We are owing or in debt to the God continually concerning you, brothers. According to to what is worthy in us, or what is worthy, meet that which is growing exceedingly, and also the end, the charity of all of you towards one another, towards the charity, towards one another. As the faith increases, so does love. What Paul is saying is that there will always be a parallel. If someone is growing in grace, they will be growing in love, or that is to say, they will be growing in charity towards other believers, towards one another. The both will increase simultaneously. If someone's faith is really growing, it's inevitable that they're growing in charity. And if a Christian is growing in charity, it is a direct reflection corresponding to the fact that they are also growing in faith. That's what he's saying. Uh, now the word there, we translate charity, is agape. It's unconditional love, okay? It's unconditional love, okay? Remember, unsaved people can storga, they can filio, but they cannot agape. You must be spiritually energized or empowered to agape, to love unconditionally. Then he continues. Therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. But reading it in Greek, hostehemos otos and human, kalkastai and tais ecclesios, tau theo, hupertes hupomones, Human ke pisteos and pasin tuis diogmos humo kaitais delipsin hais anakthete. That we glory in you for your patience, your hupomony, and, and your in, endurance. Hupomony is like a strengthening endurance. Um, and to Mia, your patience, 
in all of your afflictions or persecutions. He's writing to a church here that's being persecuted. But then he uses the word delipsin, constriction, which ye are, which you are tolerating or which you are bearing or enduring. Things are getting tough. It's continual active in the Greek that this is going on. It begins uh, with a mere connective, but then it becomes active plural, and it's largely active plural throughout the rest of the passage. It's something that's going on. But as it's going on, he's also boasting. His boasting about their faithfulness is going on. Much the way as I boast of the believers I know who are being persecuted in Vietnam. <laughs> well, you can look at the church in a lot of countries and it's messed up, but you can look at a church that's being persecuted and you can boast in it. It's sort of like Job. The devil did those things to him, but God allowed it. But the Lord boasted in it. See? You don't have all the human race. You don't have everybody. And you're not going to get him. Now, Job, of course, in this typifies Christ, doesn't he? He typifies, foreshadows Christ. Now, understand how this works. You don't get all of them. You're not going to get those who belong to me. In the last days, we have to relate everything back to the book of Daniel in some way. Okay? Jesus had three and a half years of public ministry. Okay? Satan demands equal time under the Antichrist. He demands equal time. He thinks he can get everybody, but he won't. He won't get everybody. These are the ones of whom the Lord boasts. Now, it's not to say that God is causing their suffering. He's not. But God is allowing it. Up to a point. Remember, whenever God gives Satan a free hand, he always restricts how far it can go and for how long it can go. Okay? Same was with Job. Two times the time and a half time, not a second further. That's it. You've had your shot. Bang. Okay. These are the ones in whom the Lord will boast. It is only an opinion. It is only an opinion. I do not teach this as a doctrine. But one of the reasons the Lord is going to allow so many Christians to be martyred at the end. Okay. Okay. It is not just to purify the church, but he allows them to gain a martyr's crown because they would not be able to endure the full outpouring of Satan's animosity towards them. Okay. They snuff it, they get knocked off. And you luck out. What's better, to die in Auschwitz after one week or to die in Auschwitz after one year, if you're a believer? There's something like that. God is going to allow a lot of believers to be killed and give them the faith to die and the courage to face it, okay, because he's giving them a ticket out of here. That is something of which I am not 100% dogmatic. I am not teaching it as dogma, as doctrine. But it is something of which I am persuaded. Okay? He's going to allow a lot of us to get knocked off in order to prevent us from backsliding. It's going to become very difficult at the end. Uh, the martyr's crown is <laughs> it's a ticket out of here. <coughs> Who needs this? You know, we've all known believers in old age who love the Lord, who knew the Lord, and they're ill, and they don't want it. And maybe their husband or their wife checked out, and they don't want to be around anymore, and things like that. 
it's quite a goal to end your life the way Paul did. To be able to say, I've run the good race, I fought the good fight, I just want to get out of here. That is possible. That should be the goal of every one of us, how we want to end this life. It should be the goal. Now, rather than be in the great falling away, you're better off. <laughs> Opting out early. The more I read the book of Revelation, the less unattractive the boneyard becomes. Now, it's difficult to explain this. My son said the Kaddish for my mother, who was not even Jewish, this morning, my son is, and uh, Jewish Prayer Remembrance. Christians, they, again, have the funeral, wake funeral, before the burial. Jews sit shiva, they have the funeral after the burial. When Jesus came to Lazarus, he was already in the grave, but the family was mourning. They were sitting shiva, and it was the fourth day. Remember? It was the fourth day. Jews believed that the Shekinah hovers over the corpse of a righteous Jew for four days, halfway through the shiva, halfway through the seven days. There are things that connect with the book of Daniel in the 70th week. They're connected, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is, but it connects. Halfway through the Sheva, the Shekinah leaves at the half point um, of, of, of the seven. You understand? Of, of the last week. That was, you know, 70 times, how, how much should I forgive my brother? Well, what's Daniel's? 70 times... There's a connection. There's a connection. Whenever you see that, there's always a connection. There's a meaning for the last days in those things. Now, I can't be overly dogmatic about it, and I certainly don't want to be speculative about it. But I assure you, there is a connection. When you see the same numerical patterns, they mean something, okay? They mean something. Now, the state of affairs that the believers were facing in Thessalonica gives us something of a hint of the state of affairs the church will begin to face in the last days when things begin to get tough and people realize we're in trouble and more trouble is coming. That's what was taking place in Thessalonica. That is the place where believers need to be now. We need to understand first and second, particularly second Thessalonians. It begins telling us, look, the Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist is coming. There's going to be a seven. It's going to be cut in half. The 70th week of Daniel. How many times do you forgive your brother? 70 times seven. God would forgive Israel up to the end. There was a hiatus for the age of the church between the 69th and 70th week, but then he turns his grace back to Israel. This, then he forgives Israel. As it says in Isaiah 65 and 66, he will forgive them at the end. 70 times 70, his brothers, the Jews. You understand what I'm saying? Now, you have to understand that kind of background. Okay. Well, let's continue now to look at this. We're in verse 5. And the Ege tes dikais krosik to deo aisto tatuko tanante umas tes basileas kingdom to deo. Upertes pasikte. Just trying to think how I would put this exact thing. What a righteousness is made known, okay? It'll happen at the time of constriction. As things begin to constrict, real righteousness is going to come forth. You understand? Real righteousness is going to become more, more apparent. That's the best way I could put it. 
in a display of the just judging of God into the being made worthy, those being made worthy of the kingdom of God uh, over which or because of which things you're going through this constriction, you're suffering. That's basically what it's saying. It's going to happen, and this righteousness is going to be more and more displayed. But the just judgment of God is going to come as a result of it. As I always tell people, as I just told someone today, we are going to reach a point where what happened to the Jews in the 1930s and 40s is going to happen to believers. Being a follower of Jesus is going to be a capital crime, okay? At the Nuremberg trials, when the evidence was shown and all these films and things of Dachau and Auschwitz and Buchenwald were shown, nobody felt sorry for the Nazis. <laughs> Nobody felt sorry for the Nazis, that they were going to hang them. Nobody felt sorry for them. That's the way it's going to be. What they did to the faithful believers is going to be an indictment that is going to create a situation where the wrath of God, nobody is going to expect those people to receive any mercy whatsoever. Now, it's a separate subject, and it's a book I'm working on, No Bomb in Gilead. God will, at this time, turn his purposes back to the salvation of Israel and the Jews in a very difficult and bleak circumstance. But basically, it's going to be this. God will repay with affliction those who afflict you. Some Bibles translate it. But the actual Greek meaning is... <coughs> It's specifically because of what they did to you that God is going to do this to them. <laughs> Think of somebody, God forbid, harming your children. Think of a child molester, you know. Think of a, a, a pedophile priest, a Father McElroy or something, you know. <clears throat> Think of that. Think of Cardinal Mahoney protecting these priests, you know, what they did in L.A. Think of these things, you know. And it, it becomes displayed. <coughs> what would you want to do to somebody who did that to your child or grandchild? Okay. Say what you want about me. <laughs> you curse me, I'll deal with you. But you've gone after my children. You've hurt my children. That's worse than hurting me. Now I am going to deal with you. It's that kind of idea. You understand what I'm saying? That is what is going to enrage the Lord. Now we see this in the book of Revelation, chapter 6. The blood of the saints is crawling, calling out from under the altar. There's imprecatory prayer. How long, O oh Lord, are you going to let these guys get away with this? You know what I mean? How long? <laughs> Not much longer. <coughs> Not much longer. But understand that this is what is going to take place. Okay? Okay. Verse 6. Iper dakelion, paratheo, antipodonai, tois dilibusin, Humas delipsin. If even just next to God to repay the ones who are afflicting or persecuting you, causing this tribulation to you, you even be just. A righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. When, if they make a plea for mercy, God's going to show them what they did to his children. 
and say, this is why you're not getting any. Satan is going to become absolutely desperate. He's going to become absolutely desperate. Desperate people do desperate things. When he knows his time is limited, when he knows his time is short, he gets more and more frantic. Okay. Now, pay attention. The first major gambit was the resurrection of Jesus. Satan thought he won. Okay. The coming resurrection and rapture are likewise going to be a gambit. Satan is going to think he has got it. But then, <laughs> at that point, Revelation tells us he becomes enraged with the woman. Then he gets nuts about trying to kill the Jews. You understand what happens when, when the man-child is rescued? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? It's going to be a replay of the, of the crucifixion and resurrection. The church as we know it is going to be crucified. The church is going to be crucified. That's not to say every believer is going to be killed, but a lot of them will. But the church as a spiritual organism is not going to exist. Okay? It's not going to exist. Up until Gethsemane, Jesus was protected. Okay? He could always evade them and things like this. Up till Gethsemane, he could always evade them and get away from them. There came a point where that didn't happen. Now, of course, the suffering of the church will not be on the magnitude of Christ. It doesn't mean that's going to happen to every believer. It doesn't mean that it's going to be redemptive, that we're, that we're dying to save somebody else. Okay, it, And it doesn't mean we're going to be severed from fellowship with the Father. It's not going to be as bad as what happened to Jesus, but it's going to be in that pattern. You understand? A point is going to come like what happened to Job. The book of Job teaches a tremendous amount about what the last days are going to be like. Another thing that teaches about what's going to happen, what Paul is talking about in Thessalonica, is King Saul's pursuit of David. King Saul's pursuit of David and those psalms that David wrote under those conditions, okay, when he was being pursued. The pursuit of, of, of King David by Saul, Saul wanting to keep power. S Satan knows that it says in Daniel 7.21 that his dominion is going to be taken by Jesus and given to the saints. He wants to keep power the way Saul wanted to keep power, so he had to get rid of David. There'll be that frantic effort. That's not to say, again, every Christian is going to be killed. A lot of them will. It's not to say that our suffering is going to be redemptive. It will not be. We're saved, we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It's not to say that we'll be cut off from fellowship with the Father the way Jesus was. That's never going to happen. I'll never leave you or forsake you. But it will follow that pattern. Everybody understand? It will follow the pattern of David and Saul, and it will follow the pattern of Job. It'll be in that character, okay? Let's continue. And you who are undergoing this trouble, okay, or undergoing this persecution, affliction, Okay, be at ease in it because Jesus will be 
revealed with his angels, but the word for revealed here is apocalypsis. The apocalypse will happen. The unveiling, okay? Now understand what I'm saying, the concept, why it uses the word apocalypsis. I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's right there. I'm back of the curtain. He's not visible, but he's there. But all of a sudden, ta-da! <laughs> the sense of his presence will be withdrawn, but he will not be withdrawn from those who are his during this period. However, those who are undergoing this affliction will spiritually and emotionally and intellectually question the reality of his presence. You understand? He's left you. He's not going to help you. Even God can't help you. Even Jesus isn't going to help you. He can't help you. Satan is the Christ. It's the Antichrist. You know, he can't help you. Satan is in... That is going to be what's going to be said. Nobody can help you. God can't intervene. God can't help you. Now, the rapture, as I've explained in the book, Carpezzo, uses the term colobo, a surgical intervention similar to a cesarean section. How long will maternal labor and the contractions go on? You reach a point medically where an obstetrician says, that's it. We're going in. We're going to take the kid out. There's too much damage of hemorrhage and trauma to the mother. I'm going in and get the kid out. You understand? The mother is going through the contractions and they get worse and worse, but after 24 hours of labor, a decision is made the last push doesn't work. We're, we can't get the kid out with forceps. We're going to go in, and we're going to do a cesarean, a C-section. That is the way it's going to be. You understand? Who is going to tell a mother expecting a baby? Oh, it's going to be all right. You just push it out. It's no big deal. I've had four kids. There's nothing to it. Now, who's going to tell her that? Either somebody who is a liar or somebody who is completely ignorant of the reality. Unfortunately, we have both a liar and we have those who are ignorant of the reality. The liar is, of course, the devil. Don't worry about the Le Mans. <laughs> Don't worry about any of that stuff. There's nothing to it. Bang, bang. <laughs> now, the mother who has done the Le Mans and the rest of it and gone through the breathing thing with her husband, all that stuff, is the only time I ever lied to my wife. <laughs> Every time that graph moved, I lied. This is the last one, I promise you. <laughs> I wouldn't lie to you, baby. <laughs> I was a liar. <laughs> I was a liar. Okay. Now. If you have these courses with the midwives and all this stuff, it is proven clinically and statistically to actually help, <laughs> okay? Not only that, but if you've had one kid, the second one is easier because the orthomuscular structure of the pubic arc has already been stretched beyond 45 degrees, okay? So it, it becomes easier the second time, although no picnic, it's not a famine. It's not like the first one. 
The liar is the devil. The ignoramus are pre-trib teachers and authors. I'm sorry to say some of them are good brothers and good friends of mine. I'm not sorry they're my friends, but what they're saying and telling God's people, or uh, telling God's children, is out in left field. I speak in China, the pastors in the underground church, and the older ones and, and the ones who learned from the older ones told me about what happened in the Cultural Revolution under Mao, if you know what that was. But they were told by Watchman Nee, and they were told, you know, by Dr. Joshua Chu, they were told by these other guys who came from a tradition that went back to Hudson Taylor what was going to happen. Nobody knows how, but somehow, after the Cultural Revolution, there was more believers than there was before it. Obviously, people realized that Marxism was no road to utopia. <laughs> that was obviously a factor in the equation. But they were prepared for it by Watchman Nee and Joshua Chu and these guys. And Stephen Kong, they told them what was going to come. But these were the ones who had the right teaching. Okay. It's going to be much the same. They have to know ahead of time what is coming in order to be able to get through it. If you're told you're not going to be here, don't worry about it. That stuff's only for Christians and communist countries or in Muslim countries. This is all lies. Now, there may be Christians who are undiscerning and naive and ignorant enough to believe these lies and bold enough to teach it, but they're lies of the devil. I don't say that these people have bad motives. I just say they're teaching error, but there's another factor, and I'm very sorry to say this. Some of them have flipped and said it was wrong. Because the Holy Spirit is showing more and more people, this stuff is not right. Get ready for what's coming. And because their house is beginning to fall to pieces and they're coming up with all kinds of crazy things that pre-trip people have even taught before, a reason... And I'm not saying which ones, but I know some of the ones. I, I, I know which ones. The reason that they're propagating these things is because they have built their empires on it. They've built their ministries and organizations on it. They have a vested temporal interest in perpetuating something that is not true. They want to believe it, and they want you to believe it. And because they have built their empire on something which is not true, they have to convince themselves and others it is. Now think of a Jehovah's Witness. I've talked to a number of Jehovah's Witnesses who've gotten saved, and I listen to their testimonies on YouTube, and it's interesting. But I've talked to some who've gotten saved. And it's very difficult to see them get saved. I, got, I first came to know the Lord in 1972. I was not a very good Christian for the first few years, but let's say I've been working with the Lord since 1977 consistently. <laughs> or trying to. For the first four and a half years, I was a basket case. Be that as it may, in all those years, since then, since the early 1970s, I have led exactly two Jehovah's Witnesses to Christ. Two! I've led more Muslims to Christ than I have Jehovah's Witnesses, and there's not a lot of them. I've led more Jews to Christ. The Jehovah's Witnesses, oh my Lord. Two after 40 years! And believe me, it wasn't for a lack of trying. It's a terrible cult of the devil. 
one of the main things they say that precludes them from considering an alternative view to what they've been indoctrinated with is this. They don't want to admit they've invested their entire lives in something that is false. They don't want to admit that they have built a house of cards. They're terrified when it collapses. They have nothing. Now, I can accept that for Jehovah's Witnesses. I can accept that for all kinds of people, including Catholics, Orthodox, Jews, whatever. I can accept that for non-believers. But I cannot accept it for people who profess to be born again. If you've got something wrong, fundamentally wrong, the Holy Spirit's going to show you. And if because of some temporal priority, you are going to hold on to it, you've got a problem. You've got an idol. Your ministry is just that. It's your ministry. You're not building the kingdom of God. You're building the empire of men. But here in 2 Thessalonians, as we just read, Basilea, Paul says, know that you may enter the kingdom of God. One of the big dangers in the last days we've said consistently is when the work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work. Give them enough time, it'll no longer be the work of the Lord. It'll be their thing, not his. Okay. That's what happens. And that is already beginning to happen. For the sake of brevity, I'll only refer to certain passages in the Greek. I'd like to go word by word, but we, the time factor is difficult. Verse 7, to give relief to those who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels with him. Do you see that term in verse 7? To give relief, okay? Kai umon toes uloboneos. Kai umon toes in Malaysian and Malaysian Methamon. To you who are troubled shall be revealed. Um, rest with us. That term rest does not just mean be at peace. It means what it says in Daniel. They will receive a little help. <laughs> they will receive a little help. Now this relates back to the stories of the Maccabees. Even at this terrible time, believers who are going through it will receive just a little help, okay? Just enough to give you an assurance. Not to rest in, not that it makes the circumstances any easier, but it means you will have a kind of rest in the circumstances knowing what it means that the Lord is coming very soon. Okay? Now, different people can understand this different ways. They can perhaps relate it to the two witnesses, speculatively other things. But let's continue. In verse 8, dealing out the retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It puts them into both categories. It actually says, en punflogos, in a blasting flame, the dontos, dealing out or issuing a decusin and avenging 
Tohis hei edosin, to the ones who have not perceived God. They haven't seen the God, they're unbelieving. Kaitoes me hupakukosin, io eugelio tokurio hemon Jesu Christo. And those who are not obeying the eulagio, the blessings of the message, like you get the word eulogy from it, of the Master and Lord Jesus Christ. There will be people who are rank unbelievers, okay, who just don't believe. But there are also going to be people who know it's the truth and refuse to follow Jesus. If I become one of you, they're going to do to me what they're doing to you. Therefore, I choose to be one of them. You understand? I'd rather be a member of the SS or the Gestapo than be an inmate in a concentration camp. I know you're right. I know Hitler's no good. But I'd rather wear a swat sticker than a cross or a Star of David because they'll do to me what they're doing to you. This relates to what Jesus said. They love not their lives in this world, even unto death. You understand? <laughs> okay. Hence the true meaning of witness. Martirio. Martyr. Okay. Our problem is not going to be with people who don't believe. Our problem is going to be with people who do Backslide, they do not obey it. They know it's the truth, but they don't do it. Or they, they know he's the way, but they won't confess him. They won't turn their lives over to him. You know what I'm saying? But they know it's the truth. In Bible belts, like the American South and, and Northern Ireland, and places like that, where you have cultural evangelicism embedded in the social fabric, you have a lot of this. You have people who know it's the truth. They grew up in a Protestant religious culture. They've heard the gospel their whole lives. They know it's the truth. Their grandparents were Pentecostals or Baptists or something like that. They know it's the truth. But they don't accept it. This is a huge issue in black America among Hispanic Americans. God showed black people tremendous favor because of the hardship and injustice perpetrated against them. Many of them got saved in the 19th and early 20th century. There was a lot of black believers. If you talk to black people even in Watts today, you'll find out how many of them have grandparents, a grandmother who was a Pentecostal or a Baptist or something like that. They had it, you know what I mean? Somehow they know it's the truth. They know it's the truth, but they reject it. <laughs> this is in the Bible Belt. This is in Northern Ireland. People who know it, they are going to be among our persecutors. You understand? They are going to be among our persecutors. Well, let's continue. Verse 9. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence and power of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Politnes dekon tisusin olethron enyon apo prosopo to curio kai apotes doxes tes eskus oto. They shall be penalized with an everlasting destruction from the divine presence or from the power of the divine of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This, again, is present, continuous, active. Okay? Although its tense is future, it's something going to happen 
there's a deponency in the text. It's going to be something that is ongoing. Okay? Now it begins with, with the accusative, and then it becomes active. Then it becomes active singular masculine, and it continues um, until it gets to be the genitive singular. And then from the genitive singular, it still continues, but it again, is, is an ongoing action. There is nothing that suggests annihilation. Nothing that suggests annihilation. It is going to be an ongoing conscious experience. The term enyon there is the same term you find in Revelation chapter 14 in enyon town enyones, forever and ever from age to ages the smoke of their torment goes up. There is absolutely nothing anywhere in Scripture that suggests anything other than an eternal conscious damnation. You cannot postulate annihilationism from anything exegetically contained in the Scripture. Okay? It's going to be something that's ongoing. When he comes to be glorified in the saints in that day and to be marveled at among those who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now he ends there. Not a lot in there in, in the original text that is not translated well. But the ones who will be counted worthy are the ones who are persecuted or at least willing to be because they believed the testimony of the apostles who gave us the gospel, okay? Remember, there's going to be other people who know it's the truth, but will not do it. Quite a thing. Now. Now it heats up. Now understand what was taking place here. These guys thought, in the confusion, that the tribulation that they were beginning to experience, okay, was the eschatological last days one. They expected the Lord to come quite likely in their lifetime. At least they were predisposed towards that assumption. They thought the affliction that they were undergoing, the persecution they were facing, the tribulation that was becoming more and more difficult, okay, they thought that that was a sign of the Lord's coming, okay? And it gets to the point where they thought that because this is happening to us, we must have missed the rapture or something like that. Now let's go back to 1 Thessalonians, the last chapter of it, chapter 5. Verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Okay? He talks about these things right after he talks about the sons of light, the sons of darkness, and when they are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them. Then he goes into, because these things are true, this is how we should live. In verse 18, 18, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterance. But examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. One of the things that is going to happen in the last days is 
the false teaching of cessationism and the false teaching of what would be called later Neomontanism. What am I talking about? There will be those who are teaching against the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They will be teaching against charismatic gifts. They will be quenching the Spirit. But there will be others who will not be outlawing prophecy or whatever. But neither will they judge it scripturally to see it's from the Lord. In the last days, these two villains are unleashed. You're going to have the cessationist villains, and you're going to have the anti-discernment villains. This is what's happening, and this is how the church in Thessalonica began to get confused. You understand? It's going to happen in the last days along the same lines. It's already happening. Now it talks about let those be sober. You know Rodney Howard Brown from South Africa, the Holy Ghost bartender, be drunk. Does him be drunk? He sings a song, Drinking at Joel's Place. When you go to Joel chapter 1, verse 5, Joel says, Awake ye drunkards. Everything the Old Testament and the New Testament says about the last days is be sober. Sobrizo in Greek. They're telling you to get drunk. The church of Sardis, Jesus tells them twice to wake up. I'll go take a nap. But then, after these things, you're going to have those who quench the spirit. When you see cessationism and they despise prophetic utterance and things of this nature, what they're really doing is not despising prophecy. They're quenching the spirit. It is a complete error. Now, there is no doctrinal revelation from any prophecy. But are there prophecies? Of course there are. The opposite error. So you got the John MacArthur error, right? The Phil Johnson error, the late R.C. Sproul error. But then you have the Mike Bickle error the Francis Chan era. Don't examine everything carefully to see if it's true on the basis of Scripture. If there's one guy that's a, a, a dangerous ignoramus, it's Francis Chan. That guy is a dangerous ignoramus. The way he twists and misuses the Scriptures to justify the things he does, and he says... You're defiling God's temple if you speak against false teachers? <laughs> the reason the Thessalonians got themselves into this trouble was they listened to people like John MacArthur on one hand and Francis Chan on the other. You understand? Errors. We're going to need gifts of prophecy in the last days. Not as a basis of doctrine. We test it with the scripture on the doctrinal merits it has to see if it's from God or not. We check it out carefully. Were there prophecies when Jesus came the first time? Yes. Are there going to be prophecies when he comes again? Yes. What did those prophecies do? Well, among other things, they clarified the scriptures and prepared the people of God, didn't they? That was the same thing. So you got these two villains. You got the cessationist villain on one side, and you got this anti-discernment villain on the other. They're both villains. One is as bad as the other. So they're in this confusion now. The day of the Lord may have already happened. We're being persecuted. Yeah. There's no more gifts of the Spirit. That all ended. 
Oh, don't worry about that. I had a prophecy this was going to happen and the Lord's going to be here Tuesday. All the confusion. If you make the same mistakes as the Thessalonians, you're going to wind up in the same mess. Now, brethren... With regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our episunagage, our gathering together with him. Erotiman de human adelfoi huprates parousias, parousia. Okay, being present. Tau Koriot of the Lord, Hemon, Jesu Christo, Kai Hemon, Epi Sunagages, Ep Auton. Epi around. Get the word synagogue from it, okay? The gathering around him. It's one of the words for the rapture and resurrection happening together when we are in his presence. Es tome tecos, seluthenai, human apotonus. Mete, troistai, mete de numatos, mete dia logo, me ete di epistolos, ho de hemon, ho hoti, enest ekin, he hemera, tau Christo. Into that not swiftly, into some, into not swiftly that you be disturbed. We translate it shaken, okay? Salute and I, you, from the mind, from your mindset, from your way of thinking. And in addition, or next to that, or beside that, to be throwistai, like woken up in an alarm or warned, like, like, like an alarm going off, sort of. To wish die, that you not be put put on undue guard. Okay. No besides through the spirit or through the word or through a letter, as if from us, from the apostles. That an in, in the present, the Hamera to Christo, the day of Christ. Now it's not called the day of the Lord, it's called the day of Christ originally. Okay? It's not called the day of the Lord. It's called the day of the Messiah. Okay? Day of the Messiah. Why? People have this wrong idea that the rapture is secret in the sense that people aren't going to know what happened. They're all going to be taken out of here and everybody's going to say what happened. It is secret in the sense that... We don't know the day or the hour. In that sense, it is a secret. But it is not a secret when it happens. They're going to know. They'll look upon him who they have pierced. They're going to know. All of this left behind stuff, and there's going to be a great revival afterwards. This is all nuts. It's the day of the Lord. There's not going to be any great revival. Except <coughs> an outpouring of the Spirit upon Israel. But that's something different. So, don't be shaken. It's not going to happen. Don't be shaken. They say it's shaken from your composure. The word is like Stir it up to the point that you're in anticipation that it's going to be happening at any time. Pay attention. The doctrine of imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. Remember Jesus gave the parable of the wealthy farmer who built two barns. And he was into accumulating wealth so he could retire young. 
And Jesus said in this parable, you fool, tonight your soul has been required of you. Jesus can come at any moment for any one of us. And we should live our lives accordingly. This is the biblical doctrine of imminency. There is this counterfeit nonsense doctrine of imminency, which says there are no signs of his coming. Don't look out for any prophecies to be fulfilled even. You don't have to. He can come at any moment. You have pre-trib people like Thomas Ice, who does not deny there's a prophetic purpose of God for Israel. He's not replacement theology or anything. But he even goes so far as to say contemporary in the Middle East, events of the Middle East are not signs of the Lord's return. There are no signs. He can come at any moment. This is an invented doctrine of imminency. The real doctrine of imminency says... Any one of us can snuff it at any moment. <laughs> Live your life accordingly. That is not the same as saying the rapture can happen at any moment. It cannot. Can the Lord come five minutes from now? He can come for me. He can come for you. Should we live accordingly? Absolutely. But it doesn't depend on the rapture. I believe there's a rapture, but it has nothing to do with imminency. Nothing. They do with imminency what they do with the blessed hope. They give it a completely different meaning than Scripture does. They do with imminency what they do with philipsis. They equate it with wrath. They give it a completely different meaning than Scripture does. All false religion does this. It is a Gnostic hermeneutic. I'm not saying these people are Gnostics, but in this instance, they're mishandling Scripture the way the Gnostics do. They are claiming some insight into the plain meaning that is not inherent in the plain meaning in the context and give it a different meaning by spiritualizing it or redefining it or something. Roman Catholics, grace. Grace is not a free gift. It's not chesed in Hebrew, covenant mercy. It's not gift in, in, in Greek charism. No, it's an ethereal substance you earn by sacraments. <laughs> oh, we have grace. We believe in the grace. <laughs> it's a different meaning of the word. Okay? They all do these kind of things. They use the scriptural terms with a different meaning. The Roman church does that. Okay, Roman Church does that. They're big on it. They have something called the census plenia. Okay, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons obviously do that. <coughs> the Mormons take a verse in Corinthians referring to the pagan practice of getting baptized for the dead and try to turn it into a Christian doctrine by taking it out. They give it a different meaning. Okay, well, it's the same thing. Pre-tribulation people give terms different meanings than the scriptural definition of those terms. That's what they do. Now again, when Catholics or Jehovah's Witnesses do this stuff, they say, well, I expect it. When believers do this stuff, it's bad. But now it gets to the point where the unthinkable is happening along this very line. Let's look. Remember, don't listen if it's somebody says it's an apostolic message or somebody says, you know, it's a teaching. Or, don't listen to them. 
Let no one in any way deceive you. These people may be deceived themselves, but it is still, in every sense of the word, deception. Okay? Metis humas expatise katame dina tropan hoti ian me ete he apostasia proton ke apocalypse. Ho anthropos tes hamartias ho huios tes apoleas. Let no one by any means or in any way trick you or actually expacite seduce you. It involves spiritual seduction. Okay? Now, spiritual seduction works like any other form of seduction. We normally think of seduction as something sexual. What does it do? It preys on the emotions and it makes somebody believe something that they want to believe even though it may not be right. Like some guy picks up a girl and he's not married to her and, and he tries to seduce her into sleeping with him before they get married outside of holy wedlock. And he sweet talks her and preys on her emotions and he's trying to get her to respond to do something which is not proper at that time in that particular situation. It is outside of the parameters ordained by God for conjugal union. Well, spiritual seduction works the same way. It's an engineered emotional appeal, pretending to be spiritual, as if it's making something all right. One of these guys, Ed Hinson, a professor at Liberty University, he shows a picture, a photo, of the late film star, the, the blonde, the, the Farrah Fawcett Majors in a movie after she was attacked and shows her with blackened eyes and beat up and bleeding and everything like that. And so look at this beautiful woman and look what somebody did to her. Would Christ allow somebody to do that to his bride? It's an emotional appeal. I don't believe Jesus would let somebody do that to his bride. Look at this. Terrible. He's God. He'll protect her. He'll get her out of there. What about the church in Smyrna? You know, what about the early Christians? What about the believers in, in communist and Muslim countries? It's an argument that preys on emotional manipulation. You understand? It's seduction. The church is a character of a woman, isn't it? Husband's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And the emotional sentiments of the church are that way. That is why leadership is male. You got a pretty little sister at the high school dance, you don't let anybody mess with her. <laughs> That's not to say you don't want her to meet a nice guy who loves her and cares about her someday and marries her properly, but it does mean you don't want somebody picking her up and using her as a sex object. Because... It's the nature of a male to be protective of the woman. That's the nature. But it's the woman. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Paul says in Corinth, I'm afraid you'll be deceived like the serpent got to Eve. It's seduction. It's emotionally manipulative. If somebody is trying to seduce someone sexually, they'll present an argument that seems rational. Oh, we really are in love and we're going to get married anyway. We're going to be engaged soon. What's the difference? You know, you can make an argument that seems to be rational and <coughs> well presented, coherent. You can do that. And Satan is really good at doing that. <laughs> He, he can lay a wrap, he can put it down in a certain way and put it across. Now, if he can get Christians to believe it, and if he can get Christian pastors 
who should be protecting the church from this stuff to teach it. Oh, man, <laughs> you've got a problem. You've got a problem! Well, we've got a problem. We've got a real problem. Verse 3, it's not going to happen, as we read, unless the man of lawlessness, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. Son of perdition, he's in the character of Judas. Now look with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Also an eschatal, also a last days passage speaking about the return of Christ <coughs> in a pastoral epistle. But the Spirit explicitly says in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. The word we would translate apostatize, apostasia. That's the only other place per se the term is used in an eschatological context. It means they will depart from that which they used to believe. With linguistic trickery. Although the word is never there. Whoa. Yeah, I'll put that on. Okay. Put it on. <laughs> put it on. I'm getting serious, man. Uh, Apple out. Stay here. Apostatize to out. You depart from what you believed. Because the underlying verbal form, not the word itself or a word that occurs in Scripture, Yeah. It's better with the red? Yeah. 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 At the standby. At the standby is the underlying verbal form, not the same word. Which means a spatial departure. You understand? It's not the word itself, and it's not a term found in Scripture, per se. But because an underlying root word in the verbal form is epistemi, a spatial departure, you have people saying something that pre-tribulationists never believed. Traditional pre-tribulationism was, I wish we'd all been ready. That was traditional. That's Chuck Smith, people like that. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Dr. Mark Hitchcock. Traditional pre-tribulationists. You've got this newfangled version, pioneered by Wayne House and Thomas Ice, men who should know better, and various other people, Randy White, the, Andy Wood, it's unbelievable. They are saying the apostasy is the rapture. Because the term, because it plainly says, 
the episunagage, the rapture is not going to happen until we know who the Antichrist is. And there's a falling away because of the Antichrist. Therefore, that can't mean apostasy. It can't, Paul can't mean <coughs> what he means by the same word in 1 Timothy 4. He must mean something else. So they go find another word by etymological mechanics, not in the text. To say it means a spatial departure. Now, even that would not make a lot of sense in the overall context. Okay. Even that would not make a lot of sense. Let's try to read it their way. It would mean, let no one deceive you. For it, and the it means, obviously, the day of the Lord. It must refer back to the antecedent. Our gathering together to be with him, that is, the episunagage. Okay. It's not going to come. Coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Episodagogia are gathering to be with him. Okay. The day of the Lord has come, for it will not come <laughs> until the rapture comes first. And the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed the son of destruction. That is the way they are reading it. The day of the... Wait a minute. The day of the Lord is inaugurated by the Episunagage. It's not going to come unless the rapture happens first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now, in fairness, some pre-trib people, like Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who's a lawyer and a theologian, he successfully debated Hank Hanegraaff on the date and authorship of the book of Revelation, stood up at their own pre-trib annual conference in Dallas and said, this is crazy. Arnold Fruchtenbaum does not believe it. Traditional pre-trib people do not subscribe to what Thomas Ice and Wayne House and others are pushing. This is crazy. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? Now, the book of Revelation had not yet been written. Obviously, Daniel had been exegeting. I'm sorry, the book of Revelation had not been written. So Daniel was obviously exegeting portions of Daniel for them. And you know what restrains him <coughs> now, so that in his time he will be revealed. Greek word, katiko. Katiko, restrainer. Okay, katiko, restrainer. The mystery is already at work. As I've said many times, just as the Holy Spirit is preparing the true church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the harlot church for the coming of the Antichrist. Okay? He's also preparing the world working through the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, okay? The spirit of Antichrist is preparing the harlot church, the apostate church, for the coming of the Antichrist. Same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church. Okay. It's already at work, but something is restraining it. When it is no longer restrained, the Antichrist will, in the character of Antiochus Epiphanes, take his place in the temple demanding to be worshipped. This relates to Revelation 11 and the book of Daniel and Matthew 24 and so forth, the Olivet Discourse. The question now becomes, who or what is the catechol? Who or what is the catechol? 
if you can believe it, <coughs> there were Protestants in the Reformation and proponents of it still exist in places like Northern Ireland where there's a strong historical anti-Catholicism where they said the Antichrist is the Pope, any Pope. Now, any Pope is an Antichrist, but they say the Antichrist. And it was the Roman Empire that prevented the papacy from taking control of Rome after Constantine relocated his capital. So they actually postulate, and still do, that pagan Rome was the restrainer. Danny and myself were researching a, a book, and we found one guy who basically his method of exegesis was, he believed if you just worked out the Greek grammar exactly, it would explain everything exegetically. Now the Greek or Hebrew grammar is important, but it is only one necessary component and only one tool. To him, it was the be-all and the end-all. There was no textual comparison. You just worked out the grammar. And because grammatically, it made what he said perfect sense, he postulated that the restrainer of the Antichrist was Satan. There's been all sorts. <coughs> There are people now who are correct about the timing of the rapture. I believed it before they did in terms of the timing, and I was not the first. I was far from the first to place the rapture between the sixth and seventh seals. Then they came, and they call themselves pre-wrath. And they're right about a number of things, including the timing. But these people make the same mistake as the Thessalonians. They quench the spirit. You understand? When Jesus breathed on the apostles, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. At that time, they were regenerate. But then he told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for it. <coughs> These people do not accept baptism of the Spirit per se. They only see the Holy Spirit working at regeneration. They do not believe in multiple fillings. You understand? They tend towards cessationism. Jesus said, I will not leave you or forsake you. The Spirit indwells always. He doesn't leave faithful believers. He breathed, received the Spirit, that's it. However, in John, when the Spirit comes, it will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It will unite and empower the church to preach the gospel as the world is convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. While the Spirit will never be taken from true believers, it will be taken from the world. My Spirit will not forever strive with man, but our pre-wrath brethren, who have so much right, will not make a distinction between the Spirit indwelling and the Spirit outpoured. Therefore, the restrainer to them, the catechol, cannot be the Holy Spirit. You understand? So they say it's an angel. Well, wait a minute. If you look at what it says in Daniel, and you look at what it says in Revelation, you really can't say that Michael was restraining Satan. He was trying to kick him out. <laughs> I think it was Danny, who's here, pointed out to me the following, something I did not think of and I should have, but he pointed it out to me. 
And he said, I saw in Revelation 5, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside on the back and with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the book and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth, under the earth, was able to open the book and look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. <clears throat> and one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of Judah, that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, the shortest Eshai, has overcome so as to open the book and the seven seals. And I saw between the thrones with the four living creatures and the elders and the lamb who was there. Okay. And it goes on now, and he opens it. When you get to chapter 6, I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with the voice of thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse who sat on it and had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. How can it be an angel? The angel couldn't stop this. Once the seal was opened by Jesus, Jesus allowed him to come. No angel was preventing him from coming. <laughs> you understand? Who then is the catechol? Here is where the pre-trib people are right. It's the Holy Spirit. Only they think because they too quench the Spirit. That that means the rapture must happen. Because if the Spirit is gone, we're gone. <laughs> <coughs> That's crazy. It doesn't say the Spirit is taken. It doesn't say the catechol is removed. I will tell you exactly what it says. In verse 7. To God mustirion, for the mystery a day and a gate is already enacting, it's already active. Tes anomias, anomias, that is the lawless one, anomon, monon only, ho, only the catacon, the one who is detaining arti right now, heos ek mezu genetai, until out of the midst it may be becoming. It doesn't say he's taken. It only says he stops detaining. Now you can go. It doesn't say he's taken. It's not the rapture. He just lets him go. He stops convicting the world. Understand what happens at this point. In the Old Testament, <coughs> the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times. High priests, kings, prophets, judges, patriarchs. People had it individually. Israel did not have it corporately. Okay? And it was not convicting the world. That only happened since Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is here in the sense he was in the Old Testament. Certain people have it, the faithful believers. <laughs> Everything shifts back to an Old Testament framework and motif. God's purposes are shifting back towards dealing with Israel. Under the law, those judgments that came on Egypt commemorated in the Passover to this day, Svardaya, frogs, hoshek, darkness, dawn, blood. Harvest in your throat the drops of wine into a saucer 
It corresponds to a cup, the cup of wrath filling up in Revelation. Okay. Those judgments come on Egypt. They came on Egypt, come on the kingdom of Antichrist in Revelation, don't they? It goes back to an Old Testament way of operating. He's now going to deal with the Jews again. The believers are going to be Believers are going to be moved. Okay. Now, how does this happen? Remember Joseph. His brothers did not recognize him at the first coming, but at the second, and they wept bitterly. Jesus, the son of Joseph. Before Joseph revealed himself to his brothers at the second coming. It says he sent his Gentile servants away and personally showed himself to his brothers, the Jews. It's going to be the same. The Lord is going to take the predominantly Gentile church out of here. And they're going to look, <laughs> this was the one it's the day of the Messiah. That's why it says it's the day of the Christ. It doesn't say it's the day of the Lord in Greek. You understand? The catacomb is the Holy Spirit. But it does not say he's taken. It only says he stops detaining or literally holding down. It's like he, the Holy Spirit has his foot on his neck. Then he lifts his foot up and says, go ahead. Two times a time and a half time. Yeah. At some point after that, the rapture takes place. Between the sixth and seventh seal. Okay. That's what happens. That's what Thessalonians is saying. But by making the same mistake as the Thessalonians, we wind up with the same confusion. They're quenching the spirit. They're believing in false prophecies by not testing the prophecies. Others are just denying there are prophecies. Yeah. They're not understanding the pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. They don't understand the difference between the Holy Spirit indwelling in the hearts of believers and the Holy Spirit convicting the world. They're not making the distinctions. They don't understand the work of the Spirit. Therefore, they don't understand the work of the catacomb. Okay? So you wind up in the same mess. They teach imminency. It's not going to happen until we know the Antichrist is. Do you know who 666 ultimately is? Did you see him take his seat in the temple of God? No. Well, then the rapture can't happen. Oh, no. There's not going to be an apostasy and people following the Antichrist. That apostasy is the rapture. You couldn't make this stuff up. Traditional pre-trib people never believe such garbage. Now remember, most of this stuff, like a secret rapture, I mean, it's, it's always been secret in the sense we don't know the day or the hour, but most of this stuff is only 150 years old or less. It goes back to Margaret MacDonald. It goes back to the Irvingites. It goes back to John Nelson Darby. It does not go back further than that. It, it does not. They're making the mistakes of the Thessalonians. Now, I'll leave you with this. I've said this before. The great evangelical luminaries of the day Charles Spurgeon took out full-page adverts in newspapers warning people in England 
that John Nelson Darby was a false teacher and a despot. George Mueller, you know who George Mueller was? Took care of the kids. Darby was crazy. The Brethren Greek scholar, the most learned of the Plymouth Brethren, was undoubtedly Dr. Samuel Tregalus. He didn't go with Darby. Gar Darby's American protege was si Cyrus Schofield. You heard of Schofield? Schofield was not a theologian by training. He was a crooked lawyer. Disbarred and criminally convicted as a swindler, sent to federal prison after he professed to be a believer, not something he did before he was saved. He was a swindler. He was an embezzler, criminally convicted, sent to prison. He even ripped off his own wife's family. It was bad news. Yet this is where they're getting their doctrine? He engendered Bullinger. Bullinger was so crazy that even other pre-trib people like Harry Ironside from Chicago warned against him and publicly opposed him. In their day, these men were seen as cultic. You understand? They were seen as swindlers. They were seen as despots. Darby came at the same time as many cults did. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, they all began within that 50-year period after the Millerites. And Darby was just one of them. Would you say to somebody, or what would you say to somebody who told you the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, it's only for unsaved Jews? What would you say to somebody who would say to you that the epistle to James is not part of the New Testament? It's part of the Old. This is what Darby believed. So therefore, he says, Matthew 24, that's for unsaved Jews. That's not for Christians. The church won't be. It's insanity. It's, it's, it's crazy how intelligent people can buy into this. Well, the Thessalonians bought into it. And people are buying into it today. Please. Don't you be one of them. See you tomorrow.